the space shuttle was one of the greatest achievements of the 1980s. Um, no. It's an achievement, but only in being a great and complex way to fake space. As a child who loved science, physics in particular, I had a special interest in the space shuttle, which I thought was really awesome. But for as much as they say it's inspiring, I have to say that it didn't really inspire anything in me but a lingering doubt that only ever grew. Now, only now, have I totally figured out how they faked it. And I'm offering it up to you just out of the goodness of my heart because I'm an honest person who doesn't lie to you like NASA. I'm not above lying under any circumstances. I'm not a perfect person. But NASA, as an entity, is an evil snake. So how did they do it? Well, they had four versions of the space shuttle that you see here. And we're going to break it down. We're going to start with the heavy media prototype. I call it that because it is heavy. If you look at it being constructed here, it's made very carefully by hardworking people who think that they're actually doing something of value. They don't know that they're faking space. They're not in on the conspiracy. They faithfully build a launch vehicle that they believe has the necessary specifications and components to help these very loyal and courageous people, these astronauts, survive a trip to space and accomplish their very important mission, whatever in the heck that is. Well, the heavy media prototype was a full-sized vehicle. Like I said, it had components built by subcontractors who are many which well-meaning. It contained realistic rockets, although they didn't really work, uh, not the way that they were designed. Um, the interior is identical to a parabolic plane, which we will briefly discuss later. And it was there so that reporters and photographers would have access before the first launch. After the first launch, they didn't really have access. Now, the vehicle was built um, after this, in my opinion, the Gulf Stream 2. Why did NASA have such interest in the Gulf Stream 2? Well, the Gulf Stream 2 was about the right size, right shape, and it had the engines in the right place to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish with the space shuttle. Um, the sketch design for the space shuttle had roughly the same dimensions. If you take a Gulf Stream 2 and look at the engines, you can see how they're mounted on the fuselage. There are two of them, and they're placed just about right where the space shuttle engines would be placed. The big difference is they widened it. We'll talk about that later, maybe. Um, the number two, the second vehicle, um, is the one that you see at launch. So this is not the heavy prototype that that uh, the media got to see. Now it's switched. Now it's a completely different vehicle. This vehicle is not designed with any seats in it. It's unmanned. Um, it has a simple set of mission parameters, and they are as follows. Launch at a slight tilted angle. And then do what they call the roll program. It's very important. It rolls upside down right away so that it begins to level off in its flight well below, in my opinion, 50,000 feet. Why? Because it's on its way back down. Soon it angles downward and it has a proscribed oceanic ditching maneuver that it already starts within view. It, it happens, however, out of view, about 90 miles downrange. Where? In the ocean, where they have restricted travel. It also happens to be part of the Bermuda Triangle. Hmm, maybe that explains some unfortunate disappearances of people who perhaps saw something they're not supposed to see. Um, so, what is it made of? Well, I think it's a combination of vinyl and some kind of metal, probably aluminum, as an outer skin. And the vehicle is light, it's hollow. The boosters are uh, wall materials made out of 
the same type of thing because it holds helium. Much like an inflatable bounce house, it holds its shape, shape thanks to a constant influx of air. However, closer to launch, if you recall seeing all this ice and all this frost right before launch, it's because they are pumping in a lot of noble gas that's lighter than air, probably helium and uh, the expansion is very very cold uh, the the tank ironically is the lightest it's lighter than air it's the lightest component of all and that's why it goes immediately to the top during the so-called roll program if you look at the shuttle just prior to launch especially in the early days the early launches it has that kind of hot air balloon bounce house look to it um, i think they decided to make that center tank orange and give it this ugly striped rib chute or tube that goes down the side that it didn't have before just to make it look more mechanical and metallic. Uh, the launch vehicle is held by some kind of an air bladder to pinch the bottom and hold on to it. Um, there are some interesting shots of the launch. You can see the use of orange lights. You can see the use of steam. And um, well, let's move on with some other characteristics of the launch vehicle itself. In order to, that it doesn't fly away too early, which would be just game over, dead giveaway, not only do they have it pinched with those air bladders on the wings, but they also have it filled with water to act as ballast. And so uh, I believe the helium is a backfill to the water that escapes just prior to launch. The water acts also as a heat sink so that the vinyl doesn't burn up from the actual rockets in the jet engine or the, the propane flamed jet engine uh, so it would be fire control um, yeah so the jets are masquerading as rockets um, and the propane has been shown you can tell it's it's just streaming out of nozzles on the rim or the ring around the outside part of the cone during launch the rocket engines on the shuttle for sure um, and maybe also the booster rockets are otherwise regular engines and probably of the same type the Rolls Royce ones that are used on the Gulf Stream although they may just be different like uh, F-16 engines or something of that sort um, nobody's allowed near the launch as it probably becomes quite obvious when you get close enough to this particular vehicle the second vehicle which is the launch vehicle uh, you'll start to see some things that just don't match up and don't look right As reported and experienced, yes, the launches are very, very loud, but it's a non-sequitur to think that the loudness of the launch also indicates the factual nature of the launch, because noise can be made by, by different things than what you're seeing. A noise can be made by something other than what you are looking at thinking that the noise is made. It's basic ventriloquism, and such a trick as ventriloquism is exactly the kind of special practical effects that NASA is actually really good at, at least in terms of pulling off to defraud the public, which included me, but not anymore. And it's pretty easy to pick it apart if you just research their own material and find things like this. The first thing they installed was a huge loudspeaker through which they played white noise to simulate the sound of a rocket. They then sent a number of trucks in different directions out into the wilderness, and the drivers were ordered to stop when the noise levels became acceptable. This gave them an imaginary boundary line, and anyone living on the inside of it was offered a simple choice. Stay, and you'll never hear another television program as long as you live. Or take the NASA shilling and get out. No one stayed, and NASA ended up with exactly what it wanted. 125,000 acres of nothing. They even had to move five cemeteries. If anything about that sounded right to you, and if you 
are not completely infuriated by what NASA did there, then please don't watch any of my videos and get out. All right, moving on, since you stayed, um, the last thing uh, with the launch vehicle that uh, I think is worth mentioning is that the astronauts don't get on. It's unmanned. Um, how do they not get on? Well, they make a big show about getting on, but they don't. They climb through this little yellow brick road, they call it. Um, and it's interesting that for an open air type thing that's a public show, you'd want to be able to see them walking on, and you can because you can see their upper bodies walking on. But then, like the snakes that they are, they get on their bellies and they crawl. It's so just, it's poetic justice that these cowards crawl on their bellies along this yellow brick road to go down a tunnel, down, like going down to hell. They go down and they, and they go down where the fire is going to be. Well, it's fake fire in this case, as the shuttle goes up. It's still hot though, it's steam. So yeah, they do go underground. But that's how the Challenger crew survived. The, um, I think, uh, Challenger actually. Challenger crew survived the so-called disaster. So let's review, class. Uh, if the shuttle had these retro rockets on the nose that you see here, which are black and they are cavitations where the jets blow out, on the launch pad, would it be like a bounce house? Would it be white? Would it be vinyl? No. The answer is no. And then if you zoom in on the launch when it has the uh, booster separation, would you see them popping like helium balloons with the helium gas escaping and immediately rising? And it expands because it goes to lower pressure, so the water and the air condenses into vapor and they fall not because they are um, heavy metal things with liquid rocket fuel or solid rocket fuel. Uh, no, they fall because the helium is out of the balloon. <laughs> it's just right there in the photographic evidence. The third type is the tabletop studio model. That's how they faked footage of the in-orbit scenes. It's miniature in scale. They used it in the studio to make live video recording, stop motion, and later on in the program, some green screen footage. They use it to portray satellite launches. And as evidence, you can see in many different recordings, there's evidence of strings, but my favorite is the infamous giant head blunder that they made. It's really a good find, and it's out of their footage. <laughs> they didn't catch it. He said this is a picture, the astronaut said this is a picture from uh, being deployed from the spacecraft. Let's have a listen. Actually being deployed. Now why am I mentioning this? You know, there are very few uh, vibrations of any sort. This is a picture of the inset. Uh... This is a picture of the inset. So do you see, watch what's over here. And this will give it away for you, okay, if you didn't see it already. Uh, actually being deployed from the uh, spacecraft, you can see that the, the deploy went very smoothly at the moment. So fourth, and finally, we have the landing plane. They, I believe they chemtrail the skies just sometime different reason. One to, to pollute and obfuscate the view so that you can't see that it, the jet flies from like Area 51 or someplace, rises up, and it goes up and over Texas and comes in and lands at the Kennedy Space Center. It's not a glider. It has an engine. It's got two Rolls-Royce engines from the Gulf Stream. It's a dual-engine, one-seater with the outboard Rolls-Royce engines. Specially developed for the Gulf Stream 3, it was available, but it was already available to NASA before that because they paid for the development to have that Gulf Stream Rolls-Royce engine uh, specially made with a muffler to be extra, extra quiet. Hmm, I wonder why. I think I know. So it's got the black mesh that hides the air intakes only on the landing vehicle. Um, they have black tiles there. Why would they have those black tiles there? Just to have something black that's there. They figured this out in later vehicles um, because it's supposed to make you think that they just have black tiles there when in fact it's hiding the fact that when it lands it has active jet engines, the Rolls-Royce outboard uh, two jet engines.
So it lands. Um, I have it on good authority. It's a empty shell. It's a one seater, and uh, it's not a glider. It's powered. And then um, fifth, there's a parabolic plane that's located at a military base, and they have 90 second clips that are evidence of when they're using the parabolic dives to simulate zero g prior to their uh, chroma key 3D green screen work that they do nowadays. Back then, back then they did more of the practical effects like their your traditional magic tricks like pen and teller, you know, upside down, hanging upside down with the camera, you know, right or upside down as well, and you know, or right side up doesn't matter, um, things like that, strings and whatnot, just things to fool you. It's it was all just to fool you to fake space, to get money, to make it seem like the Earth is a globe, to make it seem like the Bible isn't true and God doesn't exist. To make it seem like you are insignificant in a vast universe. To make it seem like Satan's world, Satan's ways, are the only and best ways for you. And in fact, um, they hid what they knew at the upper levels. But now at the lower levels, we are learning that indeed, all those times you thought the Bible was wrong. You thought that the earth was a globe. It was flat the whole time. There's a dome over your head. It's just how it says in the Bible, God does exist. He loves you, cares about you, and wants the best for you. And being lied to and believing it is not what's best for you. That's why I'm sharing with you how they faked the Space Shuttle program. And now you know. What you do with it is your own business. And don't try to tell me that it's not fake, because once you realize and accept the fact that this stuff is fake, there's no going back from that. When you see the fakery of it, it's just it just keeps piling up, and there's no turning back. Uh, I'm not married to the globe. I don't care, and I don't think there's a globe, and I'm happy about that. I'd rather live in God's world with purpose and meaning and significance than a world of evolution, fake space, death, disease, decay, um, and all that horse manure. That I don't like. I don't believe in it. I believe in life. I believe in everlasting life. I believe in joy. I believe in happiness. I believe in purpose. And I believe the Bible. The Bible has been right this whole time. It's completely vindicated. And that, my friends, is an encouraging thought.